Thank you very much for uh, coming to this talk in such a beautiful evening. Um, thank you very much, Kelly, for the opportunity to, to present some of our science um, and I guess introduce you to the field of sleep research and, and sleep medicine. Um, we are a group in clinical neurosciences called Experimental and Clinical Sleep Medicine. And so we're interested in understanding why people experience disrupted sleep and how do we develop treatments to try and improve sleep, optimize sleep. So the plan uh, is I'd like to give a brief background to sleep health and, and how sleep is regulated. Um, some contemporary uh, perspectives on chronic insomnia, the most common sleep disorder. And then uh, I want to show you some of the interventions we use to try and improve sleep. Okay, I think it's pretty fair to say that um, modern culture doesn't often value sleep um, too much, okay? And, and, and uh, those who are efficient, productive and so on, um, you know, should sleep less. This is often what we're told, particularly in the business world. Um, and I think, I think uh, the famous actor uh, and indeed politician, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think summarized this, this view quite well when he said, I've always figured, figured out that there's 24 hours in the day. You sleep six hours and have 18 hours left. Now, I know there are some of you out there just now saying, hold on, wait a minute, I sleep eight or nine hours. And his response, of course, is, well then, just sleep faster. And I think, I think there is a view that, um, you know, ideally, the efficient, the, um, the, the prosperous, the productive individual uh, may need less hours of sleep. And, and if you want to be productive and effective, then you should consider maybe curtailing your sleep uh, in favour of other uh, opportunities. Um, hopefully I'll convince you that that's folly. Um, and that uh, I think Arnie may well be misguided. Um, so he was talking about sleep duration, um, and it, it's probably, it probably amazes you that only recently um, did the National Sleep Foundation actually come up with some recommendations about how much we should sleep. And now you'll appreciate here in the, in the, the dark blue, these are the ranges for the respective uh, age groups, okay? Now, I'm not quite sure if you recognize, uh, you know, your sleep duration within this range, but uh, you'll appreciate that, that there's great variability in, in one sleep need. So the, the committee that came up with these guidelines has been quite conservative and have said, well, for some individuals, take for example, someone who's, let's say, 50, six hours may be appropriate depending on, the, on their individual sleep needs. But when they look at the literature and they look at relationships between sleep duration and safety and a range of health outcomes, these are the recommended categories. So for the vast majority of adults, this is between seven uh, and nine hours, okay? Now, this in fact is only one aspect of sleep and I think probably gets too much attention. So if we think about sleep health more broadly, um, what I have here is, is, is actually uh, an individual who has worn one of these watches. So this is uh, an actigraph watch, contains an accelerometer, and you can profile uh, sleep-wake patterns or rest activity patterns uh, over the long term. Um, and so you can see, of course, we have sleep onset approximately, wake time. This individual is slightly delayed. In fact, they were unemployed, so they had a sleep onset time of about 2 a.m., and a, and, a, and a sleep offset time of about 10 a.m. Um, so you, you can see across the, each, if each row represents a day, you can see that this pattern is very stable across days. So the regularity of sleep is one important aspect of sleep health. Um, now, the timing of our sleep, where it takes place within a 24 hour day is also important and regulated by the circadian clock, the biological clock. Um, and of course, the, 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 the sometimes called the dark hor hormone melatonin effectively marks the phase um, of the sleep period. So that is one aspect, that's timing and regularity, okay? Um, but of course within sleep you have a rich uh, range of sleep stages. Uh, each uh, serves an important, important functions and the brain cycles through these different stages. 
um, multiple times across the night. So we've got the architecture of sleep, the timing of sleep, the regularity of sleep. Uh, and of course, we've then got the quality um, of sleep, which predicts the quality of our wakefulness and the extent to which we can engage in, in, in daytime functions. Um, and indeed, even the ability to maintain wakefulness during the day. Because there are a range of sleep disorders. Um, you can have difficulty with initiating and maintaining sleep, difficulty with the timing of sleep, you can have obstructions that occur during sleep. Um, and of course, you can have difficulty trying to maintain wakefulness during the, the major waking period. Um, so th there's many different dimensions to sleep health. And I think what I'm trying to say is that um, we need to limit the, the complete emphasis on, um, on sleep duration. I think continuity, timing, regularity uh, are very important features. So how is sleep regulated? Um, so, as I said, we have this circadian clock, this biological clock, and um, this clock locks onto the light-dark cycle via photoreception, um, which maintains our sleep-wake pattern at a fixed time. Of course, we're typically, most of us, awake during the day and sleep during uh, the biological night. Um, and we also have another process called the sleep homeostat, which effectively tracks um, the amount of time that we've spent awake and will push the brain into sleep after a prolonged period of, of wakefulness. Now clearly, um, these factors are influenced by uh, our genetic background as well as uh, you know, changes with age, um, but they're also influenced by psychological factors like emotional distress, um, uh, as well as social schedules. For example, those who work night shifts will very clearly understand that there's an important variable preventing them from sleeping in the evening. And of course, often very difficult for them to sleep during the wake, waking hours. Um, now, sleep is very complex. It involves a range of different brain regions and different neurotransmitter systems. So you'll appreciate that if there is even minor disturbance to these neurotransmitter systems, then you could have a, a clear uh, difficulty with sleep and the regulation of sleep and wakefulness. Often what we've discovered about sleep has come from studies where you disrupt sleep. You disrupt its function uh, and you understand its, its, its subsequent impact. So here's a study by one of my students and uh, what he did was he took uh, young healthy students into the sleep lab and he randomized half to this condition called the forced awakening. So, uh, so you can see these periods here, he actually uh, rather horribly uh, would go into the bedroom and disturb them for <clears throat> mainly 20 minutes at a time, except here there's one hour period of wakefulness. And his idea was let's try and fragment sleep. Let's understand uh, how it subsequently affects things like vigilance and overnight memory consolidation. So one half get the disruption uh, and one half, uh, very fortunately, get to sleep undisturbed for an eight hour period, okay? So he administered, this is kind of classic tasks in, in sleep science, he administered two tasks. Uh, one was very simple, which is when this asterisk appears on the screen, simply uh, respond as quickly as you can on the, on, the, uh, on the mouse, just to indicate that you've detected this asterisk. And we consider if you don't respond within 500 milliseconds, that's an attentional lapse. Okay. Um, the other task uh, is uh, a word pair learning task. So participants are presented with a series of word pairs. See these related words here. Um, uh, they're asked to remember them. Immediately after that task is completed, they're presented with one of the words and asked to fill in the blank. Okay. So here, of course, it would be boat. So they're tested on their immediate recall. Then after sleep, they're retested. And uh, it should be the case that if sleep serves an important function in consolidating memories, you should see a very nice improvement from pre to post sleep, okay? Supporting the consolidation uh, of new memories. Um, so in this study uh, that Matthew recently completed, um, we find a clear effect, which is that maybe somewhat obvious, those who had the fragmented sleep, disrupted sleep, uh, experienced more attentional lapses. Uh, and those who experience the disrupted sleep have less improvement from pre to post sleep 
relative to the group who were allowed to sleep undisturbed. Okay, so uh, clearly the fragmentation of sleep impairs next day vigilance, and we know this is important for driving, for safety, and so on. Um, but it also impairs the consolidation of, of the, that previously learned material. Um, now this is obviously uh, healthy people, um, disturbed in, in the sleep laboratory in a very controlled environment. Okay? Um, but in fact, there are about 10% of the population that have nightly difficulties with initiating sleep and maintaining sleep, so-called insomnia disorder. So the criteria you can see here, but this is a near nightly sleep disturbance, so problems falling asleep, maintaining asleep, or waking up early with the inability to return to sleep for at least three months. Um, and uh, as with any disorder, really, this also has a clear effect on daytime function. Okay? Now, the, the characteristic of this problem, which affects about 1 in 10, is excessive arousal. So people report a very active mind, a racing mind, in the hours before sleep. Um, also, if you measure the level of, of the scalp-recorded EEG, so you can see the brain is very, very active. Also, uh, in other parameters like heart rate, heart rate variability. Um, and so, what I show you here is simply that um, people who have difficulty initiating and maintaining sleep are effectively hyper-aroused. Um, but not only does that delay the onset of sleep, but the quality of your mentation in the hours before sleep actually are associated with the expression of deep sleep. So those who have a very racing, active mind doesn't even need to be about very negative uh, events or emotions. Um, seems to then inhibit the subsequent expression of that deep restorative sleep that we also know is important for memory consolidation. What I think is very, very interesting and uh, I guess um, a major development in the last decade has been an understanding that possibly people can be simultaneously awake and sleep. Um, and often we find that uh, in the sleep lab, the, the, our patients come in and they report very disturbed nights. And, we, and you know, the staff will, will say, well, hold on, I, I was awake, I was watching the recordings. It looked like you slept okay. And what is quite interesting is when you then actually analyze in detail some of that electrical activity, even during deep sleep, you can see in those with insomnia, hopefully, versus those who are good sleepers, that there's this regional uh, activation across sensory motor uh, cortical areas. And the suggestion is that even in deep sleep, people with insomnia seem to be somehow processing their environment uh, at some level possibly uh, accounting for some of this, re these reports of non-restorative sleep. So this idea that you, you're either asleep or awake um, is, is, is certainly being supplanted with the idea that uh, you can have discrete parts of the brain engaged, if you like, in wakefulness while you have a globally sleeping brain. So I think, I think this might uh, you know, map onto some of our reports when we think we've slept terrible. Maybe your partner has said, well, I thought you slept great or, or you know, I heard you snoring um, and so I, th I think the subtleties of sleep are only truly being discovered. So that is the, the, the arousal aspect of insomnia. Uh, people with insomnia also have quite uh, disorganized sleep. So you can see here, this is a sleep diary it's for seven nights, uh, black here in sleep and, and red in wake. Now you can see that there's quite a bit of variability night to night in terms of the sleep onset and offset. You can also see long periods of time in bed spent awake. And often what happens, we think over time, is as people extend their, their sleep opportunity, of course your biology is finely tuned, and so you can't expect to extend your sleep opportunity and then to immediately achieve more sleep. So you can end up finding yourself awake for long periods of time. And we believe that repeating, repeatedly pairing that wake time and often frustration with the bedroom may engender some type of conditioning such that the bedroom environment could stimulate wakefulness in and of itself. And we see this phenomenologically where people can fall asleep um, when they're watching television. Uh, and of course, they, 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 maybe the partner says you're dozing off, wakes them up and says, listen, it's time for bed. Up to the bed and it's like a light's been switched. 
So um, I, I think this is something we need to get a better handle on, this idea that um, you, you, you can condition wakefulness to the bedroom environment. It's often quite a stressful bedroom environment. Okay, so insomnia, as I said, it affects about one in 10 people. Um, now, if you look across uh, the conditions that are typically associated with insomnia, they're psychiatric disorders. Now, this, this is, a, is a figure that just plots all the uh, various psychiatric disorders and it highlights sleep continuity, i.e. that insomnia seems to be a feature of every single one of these uh, conditions, more or less. Um, and the authors conclude that uh, this may imply a transdiagnostic imbalance in the arousal system that likely represents a basic dimension of mental health. So most mental health problems um, have sleep disturbance um, as a comorbidity. This is true. Now the question is, you know, is it chicken or egg? Is, is there any role for sleep here in potentially causing some of these difficulties or at the very least maintaining them? Uh, and so one way that we've approached this problem, if you like, is to ask people again to wear um, a nactograph watch. But this time, the watches uh, allow you to um, complete some, some questions. Okay? So the, the, an, an alarm will sound, and randomly, you don't know when it's going to happen, um, and you're asked to complete a few questions about how you feel uh, and about your mental health uh, during the course of a day. Um, and so we first, so you, you can see the profile here, you've got uh, light in here, but you've also got uh, the, the black squiggles or activity, and this is the major sleep period. And so we're often trying to understand the, how the quality of this period here predicts next day symptoms and feelings. That is the, that is the, the type of study design. Um, so we, we first started uh, these studies in, in patients with severe mental illness, a diagnosis of, of schizophrenia, and the, uh, the alarm would go and the uh, participants were, were asked, just before the beep went off, I was hearing voices that other people cannot hear, feeling that someone or something may try to cause me harm, or feeling that my thoughts are being influenced or controlled. So it's just yeah, capture in the moment, um, you know, how these individuals have been experiencing their wakefulness. Um, and, and so what we found in this study, so we can measure repeated instances of how nightly sleep links to next day symptoms and functioning. And we see that the, the, the greater fragmentation of that, of, of, a, of a night's sleep, the poorer quality of, of sleep uh, predicts the severity of, of next day psychotic symptoms. So those who have more fragmented sleep or more sleep discontinuity um, report more intense auditory hallucinations, more intense feelings of paranoia, and they also uh, report poorer daytime function, as would be expected from, from our earlier studies. We've done similar work in, in suicide, uh, suicidal thoughts. Um, so we profiled individuals um, who, uh, had, uh, who reported suicidal ideation, suicidal thinking. Um, about three quarters had a history of, of a suicide, previous suicide attempt. And we found uh, similarly that uh, in this, this case, poorer sleep quality and lower sleep duration predicted uh, more intense suicidal thoughts and feelings the next day. So again, this is still, this is going from the night to the day. Clearly, we have to ask the question, well, if we treat sleep problems in, in, in a range of patient populations, is it possible that we could also improve some of the symptoms of mental health and possibly um, prevent uh, suicide um, completions, for example, in the context of, of this, this population? Now, we're still stuck with the issue of, of um, you know, is, is this truly a causal factor in the expression of these problems? Um, longitudinal studies where you, you take people at one point in time, um, they have insomnia, they don't have any other problems, and then you follow them up. Uh, you try and adjust for every possible variable that could confound your analysis, uh, and you see it at the typical, the, the, well, the most reliable relationships that you see are that insomnia, compared to those who don't have insomnia, uh, presents as a risk factor for the future onset of depression, anxiety disorders, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and, and more recent work focusing on 
cognitive decline and, and Alzheimer's disease specifically. Um, so I think, again, I have to be careful. This is still, this is about risk. This is not clear if this, these are truly, this is tru truly causal. Does it just mark a prodromal period, for example, for the onset of these problems? Um, to, to, to really address whether the sleep is driving uh, the expression of disease, we have to do the randomized studies where we randomize those with the problem to a treatment uh, or to a control and, and do some type of follow-up so we can understand whether treating sleep clearly does have an effect on health. Now, our approach to um, uh, treating sleep problems, um, you can imagine, has, has varied over time. Uh, since ancient times, we've tried to improve sleep uh, in a variety of ways. Um, I, I think most of these are now obsolete. Certainly, I hope bloodletting, witchcraft, divine healing, uh, opium, wine, I think, is probably still used the, the odd occasion, um, but of course, through to hypno kind of sedative hypnotics. Um, and if you have a sleep problem in the United Kingdom and uh, you go to your GP, the chances are um, they'll probably do one of two things. They will try and, at least initially, uh, give you some sleep hygiene advice. So, you know, advice about not drinking too much caffeine, having a cool and dark bedroom environment. Um, but the issue is that, that, that you know, people don't get better with that, typically don't get better with that advice. Um, and so uh, the most common response is uh, usually uh, a prescription of um, a sleep-promoting medication, a hypnotic. Okay? And so that, the reason I, I mention this here, I think this is quite interesting data. So this is from the openprescribing.net. It allows you to pull data from... Um, all GP practices in, in England, and so you can get a monthly uh, value of the number of prescription items for um, sedative hypnotic medications. And in fact, I haven't drawn the line here, but I, I, it looks to me that that's actually decreasing over time, that the number of prescriptions may well be decreasing. Uh, and I think that's probably because we're, we're now understanding some of the negative side effects of the medications. They're indicated short term, so they don't help people typically with long term sleep problems. Um, they, they don't recreate normal sleep. In fact, there's an argument is that they, they potentially could suppress some of the deep slow wave sleep. Um, uh, and, and there are a range of difficulties uh, with falls in, in the elderly and, and, and next day drowsiness. Um, so I think there is an acceptance that, that, that they're not ideal and certainly they're not recommended for long term <clears throat> sleep problems. The treatment that is recommended for uh, chronic insomnia, so it's insomnia that, that lasts for more than three months, is a psychological therapy called cognitive behavioural therapy or cognitive behavioural treatment. So this is a treatment that tends to focus on the factors that we assume are maintaining the problem. So this is disorganised sleep schedules, um, you know, racing thoughts and often beliefs about sleep that guide sleep behaviour. What I wanted to do was, was show you one component of this treatment now, this treatment is typically delivered by clinical psychologists. There are very few clinical psychologists in, in the United Kingdom. Certainly, to, you know, not enough to deliver uh, the psychological treatment to the millions of people with chronic insomnia. Um, but let, let me just demonstrate the, the, the approach. So, um, we profile someone's sleep over um, seven days, like so. Um, and as we discussed, you can see the variability night to night. Um, and you can also see the excessive amounts of time in bed awake. Um, and so we say, well, can we try and limit your time spent in bed um, to match your, your average sleep time? So this gentleman's average sleep time is about five and a half hours. Um, their time in bed is about seven and a half hours. And so we say, pick a rise time that you can stick to seven days a week, including the weekends. We'll work backwards, and that will give us your, your, your prescribed bedtime, if you like. So in this case, uh, the rise time was 6 a.m. with you know, a bedtime at 12.30. So the patient is not permitted to be in bed before 12.30 or be in bed after 6 a.m. to avoid napping altogether. Um, and so what this does is it does uh, two key things, really. One is that it stabilizes sleep, so you, you, you cannot be in bed after 6. So you, you receive a standard uh, exposure to light each morning, which helps the, the tune the body clock to um, that, that time of day. Um, 
you also uh, increase sleep pressure because of course in the first few days you have this partial sleep deprivation response and, and one thing that truly is good for anxiety is inc increased sleep pressure. It drives anorizal and it puts people to sleep. And so you can see into the fifth day that um, the, the, the time taken to fall asleep is reduced to about 15 to 20 minutes and the patient actually experiences a consolidated bout of sleep. Now, of course, because they experience that consolidated bout of sleep, they're actually, their brain's cycling through the various sleep stages rather than the, the fragmented, restless uh, helplessness that you can uh, sometimes experience in, in these fragmented evenings. Um, now, of course, we don't leave the patient on this schedule. Uh, we review their performance, if you like, each week. Uh, and if their sleep efficiency achieves a certain threshold, so sleep efficiency is effectively the proportion of time that they spend in bed asleep, uh, will then start to increase that allocation until they arrive at the optimal bed and rise time. Um, now you can imagine for someone who's not slept very well for, for, for years, um, returning that control to someone by just manipulating bed and rise time is, is, is quite a powerful treatment. It's in part quite a simple treatment, but in fact requires a lot of commitment from the patient. I said to you that, that um, the, the most common response if someone goes to the GP is to be prescribed a sleep promoting uh, medication. Um, this is in part because there's little resource available to uh, deliver this psychological, this effective psychological treatment, CBT. So one way that we, we're addressing this currently is through um, funding from, from NIHR to train nurses to deliver this sleep restriction therapy treatment. Um, and this is a large trial that's taking place across three regions in, in England. But we want to see, is this, a, is this a possible model? Can we train nurses to deliver a brief therapy? And can we, as a consequence, then improve sleep? Possibly reduce reliance on, on hypnotic medications, uh, improve things like productivity uh, and depressive symptoms. Um, and so, so it's a new way of, of introducing, if you like, primary care sleep treatments because we know GPs will just do not have the time um, to be able to administer such a treatment. So we think practice nurses might be one, uh, one possibility. So there's 600, nearly 600 patients in this study um, and, and the results will be due in a couple of years. Um, I noticed as I was coming in that there was a, a stand uh, talking about Sleepio. Now Sleepio, the other approach that we take to um, try, trying to widen access to evidence-based sleep treatments is uh, through something called Sleepio. So my colleagues, uh, Colin Espy and Peter Hames, developed this treatment um, and it is a digital uh, treatment. So it's a, effectively a digital cognitive behavioral therapy delivered by this chap here, who's an animated therapist, they call him the prof. And you have six sessions with this gentleman uh, online. Uh, so often over a six to eight week period. Um, he prescribes you a bed and rise time. Um, he introduces you to concepts and, and techniques that could help improve your sleep, cognitive and behavioral. Um, and you also have access to a community where you can ask so-called experts a, a question um, the, 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 uh, about sleep or about the therapy, but also interact with other users of the treatment um, and, and discuss ways of trying to improve adherence and, and I guess, gain some support from the wider community of users. So digital, it's a digital treatment. Um, and in part, this is again, because you know, the, there are very few providers of this type of treatment face to face. So our vision was, well, can we develop something that um, it would be available to the, to the masses? And in fact, you can see from, from the, the stand that uh, I understand that the Sleepio is in fact available to every single person in the Thames Valley region. Um, so it, this is now accessible if, if, you, if you're interested for, if, for no cost. Um, so, of course, it's been some years now since this was developed, but initially we wanted to make sure that we, we, we had a high quality trial to ensure that, that this treatment was truly effective. So we had the digital CBT delivered by the professor and we created a placebo that effectively was a nonsense treatment, but in, required attending the sessions online. Um, and appeared credible to the participants. And then of course we had a group that um, didn't get access to anything. 
Uh, and so you see what I think is, 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 is a clear example of a placebo response. So the placebo group is, is uh, the imagery uh, relief therapy, IRT, which outperforms the group that get nothing, the treatment as usual. But of course the CBT group outperform both of them. So there is something active, uh, as we would expect in the CBT treatment, that is improving uh, insomnia symptoms. Um, I realise I'm, I'm a few minutes over time, so I'll go a bit quicker. But I wanted to say that, uh, we, we, of course, we can improve sleep and perceptions of sleep. Um, but is this making a difference to people's quality of life and, and the functional aspects that we think often drive treatment seeking? Um, so we've shown now that, yes, it's true in a large trial of 1,700 people with this digital CBT versus sleep hygiene, that um, the digital CBT improves quality of life. It also reduces depressive symptoms and improves self-reported functional health. Um, so I think the digital uh, approaches to sleep optimization is, is certainly one way of proceeding and getting um, evidence-based treatments out there to the, to the one in 10 that have chronic <laughs> sleep problems. I wanted to say, I guess, finish with a couple of notes of caution. One is, I'm not sure if many people have a Fitbit or a similar type of device. Um, I think these devices, uh, wearable devices, can be effective, but uh, in terms of educating people about sleep and so on. Um, but the, the difficulty is that often they're not validated against true objective measures of sleep. And so I want to highlight one study to you here that compared one device called the Fitbit Flex with um, concurrent uh, polysomnography, that's, that's the objective gold standard measurement of sleep in the laboratory. So the Fitbit came back with this value, 371 minutes of sleep, but actually the real true objective gold standard says about 457 minutes. So there is a huge underestimation in the, for this particular device in this particular study. So I guess, I think what I'm trying to say is these devices are interesting, um, possibly useful in terms of rest activity patterns, but I would treat, treat them with some, some um, skepticism about the, the, true, you know, the true values that are generated. And we actually uh, wanted to understand what would happen if you give people false feedback about their sleep? Because we think these devices may be giving false feedback to many, many uh, individuals each morning. And so what we did was we brought people into the sleep lab and we gave them this device um, that we told them uh, operates similar to a Fitbit. It's going to tell you in the morning uh, how you slept. Um, it's going to tell you the quality of your sleep. Um, and in fact, that was nonsense because we randomised them to either receive positive or negative feedback irrespective of their actual sleep. And so the, we, we then measured um, across the day, we measured reports of daytime function. Okay? And so there, there, were, there were two groups, a group that got the positive feedback, a group that got the negative feedback. And maybe this is the answer is, is going to be somewhat obvious here. But you can see that before the manipulation, that's the night before in, in the sleep, sleep laboratory, the pretty similar reports of their cognitive function, their ability to, to think clearly and so on, and their memory and so on. Um, uh, and this, these are similar it declines um, uh, just uh, you know, at, at the rise time period. Then they get their feedback. And of course, the group that get the positive feedback rate their cognitive function much higher than the group that get the negative feedback. Um, now I would say that uh, of course the issue here is that there's no group that gets a neutral condition or a group that doesn't get any feedback. However, if you look at six o'clock night one and six o'clock six o'clock and night two, you'll see that the positive group have very similar values, you see in red here, uh, and in fact it's a negative group that actually have a deficit compared to night one. So we think that it's the negative feedback that effectively modifies how you interpret your day and as a consequence report and detect possibly um, various impairments. Uh, and so we now want to try and understand whether in some people, perhaps those who have a vulnerability, if um, these devices, if they're giving and delivering false feedback, could in fact drive sleep problems or the, or the genesis of some sleep problems. 
I don't want to, to you know, be all doom about it, but I guess what I'm trying to say is it just be somewhat skeptical of, 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 of the values that you're getting back. Okay, so just to finish, um, you know, I, I've talked mainly about psychological treatments. I've mentioned um, uh, te the technological de uh, developments. Um, there are a few other areas of sleep science that I think are, are really worth watching out for. So probably in the last decade, we've worked out how we can manipulate specific features of sleep. So that's um, specific waveforms um, that are characteristic of various stages of sleep. And so one group in Germany, um, I think back in 2013, really found out that if you deliver tones during sleep, that are uh, synchronized to particular waveforms. So this here is a slow oscillation. This is a deep part of sleep. If you deliver the tone uh, in a particular way, you can actually enhance those features of sleep and potentially as a consequence, enhance the functions of sleep. And so what they showed was when you deliver these tones at the same frequency of these oscillations, you in fact improve overnight memory consolidation versus a sham condition. So that's, if you like, some, some type of sleep engineering where you're targeting direct features of sleep to, to enhance its function. So I think that, that as far as I'm aware, there are no clear studies yet in, in clinical populations, um, but I think this is the next step. Can you modify, can these be used for therapeutic benefit? We're doing other things in the sleep lab where we're using electrical brain stimulation to see if we can reduce cortical arousal and consolidate sleep. Um, and other groups are, are, are trying things like um, uh, cerebral thermal uh, uh, therapy to try and apply a, a kind of cool stimulus to the, the forehead to see if you can again tune down um, brain activity and improve the onset of sleep. But I should say all of these uh, I think are untested um, or truly uh, untested in, in larger trials of insomnia patients and those with chronic sleep problems. But I think this is probably um, the future. So I want to finally say that, that uh, we, uh, I think Kelly mentioned, you know, another part of my role is to, is to direct a, a sleep medicine program. One way that we, we, we think that very few healthcare professionals have access to training in sleep and so uh, in, in, in I guess a kind of landmark for Oxford that we created an online program in sleep medicine where we can train healthcare professionals from around the world um, in various aspects of sleep medicine. So they log in each week, they listen to seminars, uh, sorry, listen to lectures and, and take part in seminars. And this is a way for us to try and improve, you know, sleep problems affect nearly every single, you know, uh, medical subspecialty. And so if we can try and enhance sleep education, we think we can transform the, the management and the assessment and the management of sleep disorders. So hopefully, uh, I'm sorry I'm a few minutes over, <laughs> um, hopefully I've given you a brief tour um, uh, through the, the sleep research world, introduced you to some possibilities in the future and, and shown you some data to, to suggest that psychological uh, treatment approaches are very effective in the management of, of chronic sleep problems. I'd like to thank uh, my team here and, and, and the funders of, of this, this science. Thank you for your attention.